pleasure to have Professor Mohamed Gomi again in Brazil. He's from Georgia Institute of Technology. And this time he'll talk about form vertex theorems in Riemannian surfaces. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's great to be back in uh, Brazil. My uh, third time in this conference is a second time at IMPA. And uh, of course, it's, uh, this time it's uh, special. It's the uh, birthday of Marcos Dajer, so uh, happy birthday. It's uh, very nice to be here. I first uh, I heard of um, Marcos when I saw his book uh, on submanifolds when I was in uh, graduate school. And uh, yeah, so it was kind of an eye opener for me to see that it's possible to uh, state results very precisely, but at the same time give a very uh, clear and uh, concise proofs. And I also like the notation. I thought it was quite elegant and tried to emulate that in my uh, thesis. Uh, yes, yeah, so my talk is also on submanifold the geometry, but uh, it's uh, <laughs> classical in the sense that uh, both the uh, dimensions and the co dimensions here will be low. So as opposed to uh, we uh, to Eros talk yesterday where it was uh, announced that the n was going to be bigger than uh, 2 in the beginning. Here, n is going to be 2. So it's a little bit uh, complementary. So uh, let me start by reminding you what the four vertex uh, theorem is. Uh, so this version goes back to Nieser in 1912, uh, who showed that any simple closed curve in R2 has at least uh, four vertices. So just uh, whenever I talk about curvature here, this will be a sine curvature. So remember that if you have the moving tangent along the curve, and if it makes uh, some angle theta with a fixed uh, direction, then this will be just the rate of change of the angle. And sometimes I'll be talking about geodesic curvature and the proof. The definition is the same, except you measure the angle with respect to some uh, parallel uh, uh, line field. And of course, this is uh, one of the first things that, uh, if not the first thing that the students see in a classical class on differential geometry. And uh, I'm sure many of you will be uh, teaching such classes. So uh, I cannot resist uh, making some elementary uh, remarks about the Proof. You see, the, the proof for the convex curves that's in most textbooks, it's very uh, uh, non-transparent. And I remember when I was a student, it uh, uh, bothered me quite a bit. But uh, there is a very uh, nice and transparent way to prove it for the students. Uh, suppose you have a convex curve, and suppose uh, towards the contradiction that it has only uh, two vertices, uh, one minimum and one max. Right? You must always have at least uh, two by compactness. So uh, the intervening segments, just to pick the midpoint of this one and this one, and connect them by a line. So this segment is now going to have point-wise smaller curvature than this one. And this violates uh, this uh, Cauchy's arm lemma, that if you have two convex curve segments, and one of them has a smaller curvature than the other one, then the distance between the endpoints are bigger. So, uh, Next time you teach the class on differential geometry, maybe you can uh, uh, prove it uh, this way. And the details for this, you can find uh, in Chern's notes, or Guggenheimer, or the lecture notes on my own uh, website. OK, so why did I say that n was going to be 2? This is a very uh, two-dimensional phenomenon. There is no uh, generalization of this to higher dimension. Or if you want to hedge your bet, there is no obvious generalization. So how would you try to generalize this? You can think of the hypersurfaces in Euclidean space. However, you can construct closed convex hypersurfaces with only two critical points of Gauss curvature using the generalized solution to the Minkowski problem by Hermann Gluck, who, who showed that uh, any function, that a positive function that you put on a sphere can be realized as the curvature of a closed convex surface. So there is no generalization of this for gas curvature in higher dimensions. Also, there is not even any generalization for mean curvature in the higher dimensions. Uh, that's within the context of uh, Christoffel problem. And there are some necessary conditions by Pogorelov that you can 
uh, used to construct these closed surfaces with only two critical points of uh, uh, mean curvature. So that's why you have to stay um, in the plane. So as far as generalizing this is concerned, then um, one can wonder why the simple condition is necessary. Well, the simple condition is necessary because uh, the result is not true if the curves uh, intersect. Let's see. Ah, oh, there it is. Right. So how about uh, non-simple curves? Well, it's not true. If they intersect, then they may, may not have uh, four vertices. These are examples of the curve with just uh, uh, two vertices. And the naive conjecture that you can make with regard to four vertex theorem for non-simple curves, you can't say that, OK, if the rotation index is 1, the same as the circle, then it must have four vertices. But the middle curve has rotation index 1. <coughs> And it has only two vertices. So rotation index doesn't matter. As the curve on the right shows, you can construct them with any rotation index. And only two vertices. So at this point, you might say that, OK, there is no version for non-simple curves. Uh, but uh, Pinkall found uh, 70 years after uh, Nizer. And there have been kind of many different versions and approaches to four vertex theorem in the meantime. Yet uh, no one had uh, noticed this. And he had this uh, uh, delightful uh, observation that uh, really excited me when I first saw it, that uh, any closed curve in R2 which bounds an immersed surface must have uh, four vertices. So what does it mean, bounding an immersed surface? This curve bounds an immersed disk. Uh, here it is. So bounding an immersed surface means that, uh, what's the curve? The curve is. Uh, uh, image of the map of a circle. If you can extend that map to a compact surface bounding that circle in a locally one-to-one -one way, then it satisfies a pink cost condition. So in the previous picture, none of these extend to a uh, immersion of a compact surface. So this was uh, very interesting. And of course, it generalizes a neither because if the curve is embedded, it bounds an embedded disk already. But, uh, right, but you know, still, it was uh, troubling. Because that disk that's there, you can't think of it as an abstract Riemannian surface of uh, zero curvature. And that curvature of the curve, you can't think of it as the geodesic curvature. So it's really an abstract, intrinsic object. You have this flat disk. And uh, if you want to talk about vertices on the boundary, why do you need to refer to an ambient space? So could there be an uh, intrinsic version of the four vertex theorem in terms of geodesic curvature? So that's the thing that it made me wonder. That's, that's the first question I'm going to address in this talk. Now, there's also a second issue. Uh, it turns out that the Pinkel's theorem and therefore Nieser's theorem also hold true in the sphere and the hyperbolic plane because the stereographic projection preserves vertices and also the inclusion map of the upper half plane, if you think of it as a subset of R2, it sends uh, curves of constant curvature to constant curvature. It preserves vertices. So another question that you can ask is uh, why R2, S2, and H2, the simply connected space forms, why are these special? Does the four vertex theorem hold in any other space? So that's the other thing I'm going to uh, uh, comment on in this talk. OK, so first thing first, could Pinkel's theorem B have a purely intrinsic or Riemannian version? Or more precisely, if you have a compact surface with boundary and constant curvature, must the boundary have uh, four vertices in terms of geodesic curvature? So it turns out that um, yes and no. Uh, if you have a compact surface with boundary, then every metric of constant curvature induces four vertices on M only when m is a disk. Uh, on the other hand, you can't find the counterexamples of any topological type. As soon as you have a non-simply connected surface, you can put a metric on it of constant curvature of prescribed sign, which picks up only two vertices on the boundary. Uh, the first uh, paragraph is just a direct consequence of Pinkel's theorem. Because if you have a disk of constant curvature, it globally, isometrically immerses 
in a space form, just by analytic uh, uh, continuation, essentially. So the first one just quickly follows from uh, Pinko. It's, uh, so the proof is by cheating, the, the first one. The content of the theorem is mainly the uh, second paragraph, which I'm going to explain. But let me say that the, the, the first paragraph still, you know, it's a purely intrinsic statement, yet the only way I know to prove it is to appeal to Pinko. So, right, if it's purely intrinsic, you would expect to find a purely intrinsic or Riemannian proof. And I've thought about it for some time, and I wasn't able to do it. So this might be a, a nice problem or exercise to think about. I think the solution, if you can find it, should be uh, uh, pretty. Okay, so let me show you that uh, when you have a non-simply connected surface, how you, how you can construct these metrics with a few vertices on the boundary. So, right, so the, the way I found this uh, counterexample was after many attempts to prove it, which wasn't successful. And I think ultimately I got uh, inspired by this uh, picture many of you have seen, this, uh, this Ionian columns. If you look at the top of an Ionian column, uh, it's a very uh, special curve. Uh, up there in the middle, you have a vertex where the curvature is minimum. And as the curve gets extended, the curvature gets uh, bigger and bigger. So you can construct these curves to construct these uh, counterexamples. OK, so for a disk, you can't construct a counterexample, right? So what's the next topological type? The next topological type is uh, you take a torus, and then you punch out a disk. You obtain a compact, non-simply connected surface with a connected boundary. So look at the first picture. If you glue sides three together, you obtain uh, this square with the hole punched out in the middle. And then, then you just have to glue the opposite sides of that square. You're going to get a torus minus a disk. So the first picture on the left is a torus minus a curve. Then you're going to end up with that boundary curve in the middle. That boundary curve in the middle is a portion of that Ionian curve that I showed you. It has only two vertices, a minimum at the bottom, and then the curvature gets bigger at the top. Then when you glue them, and it's not, um, it's, if you're a little bit careful, you can actually obtain a C infinity curve. So this is an example of a genus one flat surface with only two vertices on the boundary. And you can construct higher genus ones, as I've shown on the right. Basically, you can kind of uh, spiral these things, and the gluing will be more complicated. And uh, you can construct them of any uh, genus, kind of in this uh, uh, fractal fashion. But seeing the higher genus, of course, it, it becomes more complicated. So I'm going to give you a more uh, sof sophisticated proof of the existence of these things. Also, I'm going to prove a more general thing. Suppose you have a compact manifold with multiple boundary components, and you want to put a metric of constant coverage on it, such that on each boundary component, you have two vertices. So how do you do that? Well, first, I'm going to construct a flat metric, and then I'm going to show that if you have a flat metric on a surface of boundary, then you can't perturb that flat metric to also construct metrics of uh, constant curvature. These perturbations will be with respect to the C infinity metric. So they will not increase the number of vertices on the boundary component. So how do you put these flat metrics with a few vertices on the surfaces? Uh, so th our surface is M. And you can, we, we think of it as a closed surface, uh, M bar minus the K disks, one for each boundary component. There are three special cases that you have to construct the specific counterexamples. And I describe a general procedure. The first special case is uh, when you have a sphere uh, and then you punch out two disks. So when you have a topological cylinder. And the example is uh, that picture shows a uh, metric on the cylinder with only uh, two vertices on each boundary component. Here you have, uh, these are sine curves. So like the top boundary component has a vertex in the middle. And then you have uh, vertices on the right, uh, right and left once you glue them. So you only end up with two vertices on each component. Uh, the second special case is where you punch out one disk from the real projective plane. And that gives you the Mobius strip. So here the picture is going to be just like the top picture, except you do your gluing with a twist. So when you do your gluing with the twist, uh, what happens um, to, the, um, to the endpoints? Uh, those are going to turn into inflection points. So you end up with uh, two vertices and uh, two inflection points. 
Uh, there's a, the third special case is when you have a torus and you punch out the disc. I already discussed that. This is one of these Ionian examples. And uh, to construct a smooth one, you can just integrate that uh, uh, curvature function. So how do you do this in general? So in all the remaining cases, uh, you can show that you can put a flat metric. So this is a metric of zero curvature with exactly k conical singularity. So what's a con conical singularity? Flat metric means that uh, each point has a neighborhood which is isometric to the plane. A conical singularity is a point which has a neighborhood which is homeomorphic to the neighborhood around vertex of a cone. So this is more general, right? Because if the angle of the cone is 2 pi, then you just get your uh, flat surface. So the idea is to take these closed surfaces and put k singularities, one singularity for each boundary component, and then cut out these singularities. Then you're going to get these boundaries. And it turns out that these singularities, you can cut them along curves, which will result only in two vertices. So, so first of all, how do you put these singularities on? If you have a closed surface with k singularities of, of angle theta i, then it's just a simple computation using gauss bonnet that the x's angles add up to 2 pi times the Euler characteristic. Now, it turns out that the converse is also true. It's a theorem I've traced to uh, Trojanov, that this condition is also sufficient, that if the arithmetic works, um, so you, the right and left hand side of that equation balance, then in fact uh, you can construct these uh, flat metrics with uh, that many uh, singularities. Now for the arithmetic to work, uh, k cannot be uh, too small or the Euler characteristic cannot be too low. So that's why there were three special cases. But special for, except for those three special cases, uh, the arithmetic here works and you can apply it to show that uh, uh, yes, in all the remaining cases, you can put uh, flat metrics with as many singularities as you, you like. So once you have these singularities, now we're going to cut them out. Uh, so, the, so it turns out that if you have a cone with a non-trivial angle, so the angle is not 2 pi. Now if you look at the circle centered at the cone vertex, there exists a C infinity perturbation of it, which has only two critical points of curvature. So. So this shows like the f that you know the four vertex in the plane is very special. When that angle is four pi, no perturbation of it is going to yield only two vertices, right? Any perturbation by Nisa's theorem must have at least four vertices. But as soon as that angle is not uh, four pi, then you can do these uh, perturbations. And the way you, you, the the proof is uh, easy; it's just very constructive. If the angle is a multiple of two pi, then you can construct these examples uh, explicitly. So these, are, these closed curves all have uh, only two vertices for n equals 2, 3, and 4. Uh, so, so, so what am I doing? See, uh, right, so I guess uh, I should mention something. So if, if you have a cone, angle is a multiple of uh, 2 pi, you can think of it as an n-sheeted covering of the plane. So these curves are just in the plane, but you can also think of them as being in the cone. So that r is the distance from the vertex of the cone. So they're easy to construct when it's a multiple of 2 pi. Now what if it's not multiple of 2 pi? If it's not a multiple of 2 pi, right? I mean, so the way to think about it is that if you cut your cone and then flat it into the plane, it's not going to close up. But then you can take some subsegments of these curves. Right? So you flatten your cone, and uh, you get something like this. But you know, you use examples like this. Again, if you're very careful, I mean, you don't have, just a little bit careful, then the gluing will be uh, smooth. OK, so this uh, proves the theorem. This is how you put the flat matrix with only two vertices. OK, but I claim that you can't put metrics of constant curvature of any prescribed sign. So the next uh, lemma that we need is that if you have a compact surface with boundary and flat metric, then uh, you can't perturb these to have a constant curvature and the perturbation is uh, uh, smooth. So this is very easy when the surface is simply connected because if it's simply connected, you can isometrically immerse it in the plane. And the whole plane, we can uh, perturb it to a, a sphere or to the hyperbolic plane using uh, this uh, 
famous perturbation. This was already known to uh, Riemann, um, right? This delta, when uh, lambda is zero, you get delta ij, which is the Euclidean metric. And for the rest, you have uh, uh, metrics of constant curvature lambda. So, so I just didn't have to explain to you when you have topology, right? How do you perturb uh, this uh, surface? And uh, so this sounds like one of those problems involving uh, Gromov's H principle. But uh, there is some um, simple way of proving it. OK, so what, what happens if your surface is not uh, simply connected? Well, any compact surface with boundary, so what are these? These are these uh, polygons, right, with two end sites. And the boundary means that you have punched that disk in the middle. So this, uh, now, so if you have one of these models, it's not going to be simply connected because of these holes in the bottom. But you can make it simply connected by making some extra cuts, like I have done. So extra cuts means that you're going to connect the boundary to the side uh, with some uh, curve and then cut that. So this is a surface which is an octagon, right, with opposite sides identified. So it gives you the connected sum of uh, two tori. So this is the connected sum of two tori with two boundary components. So if you do that, then uh, we obtain a single curve. So a single curve, I guess I don't have something that reaches so high. So a single curve here means that uh, you go down to the boundary, you turn once around, and then you come back. So that segment is like traversed twice. OK, so it's a single. I think of this as now a topological disk with a single boundary component. So I have a single boundary component, it's a piecewise smooth, and you can immerse this boundary into a space form by using the curvature function along the boundary. So recall the fundamental theorem of uh, curves for Riemannian surfaces. In textbooks, they only stated for uh, uh, R2, but it works in any Riemannian uh, surface. If someone gives you some function, you can realize it as the geodesic curvature of a curve with uh, some uh, initial conditions uh, prescribed. Um, so although it's not mentioned in the text, it's uh, basic proof. This is the, you're basically prescribing the geodesic curvature along the curve. It's just the second derivative dotted with the uh, uh, core normal, you can write it as a system of ODE, so just by basic ODE, uh, it exists. Okay, so, right, so remember I have this region, it's uh, in the plane, right? So everything here is flat. Now I have my boundary curve and I have the curvature function along the boundary curve, and when I say curvature function, I also include the angles at the vertices. Now, I'm going to perturb my plane let's say to like a sphere with very small curvature. Then I'm going to draw the same contour in that sphere using the fundamental theorem of curves. So when I do that, my curve no longer is going to close, okay? But the key idea is that the point that you start and end with be on one of the curves which correspond to the boundary of your surface, right? So you, you perturb the curvature very just a small amount, so it's not going to close, but it's going to come very close to closing. Uh, so the the endpoints here, there will be C infinity close. So you just can't take a step function and just glue one to the other, and that creates only a, a smooth perturbation on the boundary. Right, the vertices only depend on like uh, you know two three derivatives. So if you do a smooth uh, perturbation, you're not going to change the number of uh, vertices like that. So now you have this uh, immersed region in the sphere, and uh, or we have this immersed curve, but it still bounds an immersed region. And uh, then you can glue the opposite sides. Uh, you see, in, in this whole thing, the only perturbation I did was on the, that little circle. The opposite sides were not affected. They still all have the same length. All the angles are preserved, so you can glue them to get this uh, connected sum of uh, uh, two tori again. Okay, so you can just do your uh, gluing. So that uh, that finishes kind of the first part of the uh, talk, which was with respect to the existence of an intrinsic version of a four vertex theorem. So the answer is uh, no, you can't do it because of these uh, examples. So now the next thing is about, uh, how about uh, for complete Riemannian surfaces? So what do I mean? So remember that Nisa's theorem holds in R2, S2, and H2, the simply connected uh, space form. 
So can you do it in any other surface? So here again, uh, it turned out to be uh, no. So why is it that R2, S2, and H2 are uh, special? Or another way you can think of it, so this is a very curious characterization for simply connected space forms. Simply connected space forms are the only two-dimensional Riemannian manifolds where neither for vertex theorem holds. So why is that? Again, the, the proof will be by a bunch of uh, counterexamples. Uh, a very important lemma here is this result of uh, Jackson. So uh, he, made a, he had a very nice observation. So if you have a Riemannian surface with curvature k and you have a point of a surface, which is um, where the gradient of the curvature doesn't vanish. So infinitesimally, the curvature is not constant at that point. Now, if you put a metric circle around that point, if you just put a small circle, that uh, circle uh, is going to have uh, only uh, two vertices. So this means that the, the, four the four vertex theorem, if it holds in any surface, that means that the surface must have constant curvature. And so that's, that, you know, it's a big hell. So what we need to show is just that there are global consequences as well. Yes? Do you know the proof of Jackson's theorem, what, what he uses? Uh, the, I think it's just, uh, he just computes, I think. Yes, I think it's just kind of a straightforward computation. But, but yeah, it's, it's very nice. So the point of our theorem will be what global uh, consequences you can draw. So, so I want to show that the only complete Riemannian surface where every simple closed curve has more than two vertices are the space from a fundamental group. And actually, it turns out that you also pick up uh, uh, RP2. For, if you demand that there have to be at least four, then you have just R2, S2, and H2. But if you require more than two, you also pick up uh, RP2, as I uh, mentioned shortly. So how do you prove it? Suppose that it has an easiest four vertex property. Then uh, by Jackson's theorem, it must have constant curvature 1, 0, or minus 1. So then uh, by the fundamental theorem of space forms, it must be a quotient of R2, S2, or H2 by the action of a uh, discrete group of uh, isometries. Okay? So, so there are three cases then corresponding to whether you have uh, curvature is positive, 0, or negative. So the elliptic case, suppose the curvature is positive. Now, so this is a theorem of Mobius. It's even older than uh, Nizer. It's like uh, middle of uh, 19th century. That every simple closed non-contractible curve in RP2 has at least uh, three uh, inflection points. So as far as I know, it, and maybe someone can educate me. I think this is like the first result in global differential uh, geometry, the three uh, vertex theorem, the three inflection theorem of uh, Mobius. But uh, between every pair of inflection points, you must have a vertex. So you will have uh, at least uh, three vertices as well. And uh, that's sharp. If you think of the RP2 as like a disk with uh, opposite points, uh, identified, then the curve looks like this. So this is like one inflection, this is another inflection, and then the other one you pick up at the boundary because it's glued with a, a twist. Now if on the other hand it is contractible, then when you lift it to a covering space you get two distinct curves, and the covering is one to one on each of them. So by Nisa's theorem, each of the pre-images must have four vertices, but then the covering restricted to each one is one to one. So then the curve must have uh, at least uh, four vertices. Okay. So when curvature is positive, you have it. Uh, so this this takes care of it in this case. So in each of the remaining cases, you can construct a curve with less than three vertices. So how do you do that? Uh, for the parabolic case. Uh, 
it's easy so if you have a flat surface right um, which is not uh, uh, simply connected uh, I mean uh, so what do you have you have the flat cylinder you have the torus you have the Klein bottle they're all covered by the plane and they're all going to have a simple closed geodesics so pull back this simple closed geodesics to the universal cover uh, they lift to a uh, straight line and uh, then the covering will be just like a cylinder now if you have a straight line you can perturb it according to a sine curve and so the sine curve is going to have two vertices on each uh, period so it's very easy for the uh, parabolic cases basically you perturb the simple closed geodesics uh, in the hyperbolic case is essentially the same it's just a little bit more involved so if you have a hyperbolic surface which is non simply connected it must either have a cusp in fact it must have three cusps or it must have simple closed geodesic uh, suppose uh, your surface has a cusp uh, a cusp is asymptotic to a cylinder and in the previous slide I showed you how to put a curve with only two vertices on a cylinder so at the cusp ends of hyperbolic surfaces it also works very easily if you have a simple closed geodesic again you look at, take a pull back to the universal cover so these are either semicircles or lines that go to infinity after conjugation you can assume there's a line going to infinity and then so that's that's what the sine curve looks like in the hyperbolic plane um, because remember in the hyperbolic plane dilations are isometries so basically this simple closed geodesics you can perturb them to curves with only two vertices both in, both in the parabolic case and in the hyperbolic case so this is this is how you prove that uh, topology is important that's why these spaces where the Nieser's theorem holds must be uh, simply connected now so but then we also have a uh, Pinkel's theorem right he generalized the uh, Nieser's theorem remember that uh, by Pinkel's theorem and its extension any closed curve bounding a compact surface again in a simply connected space form has four vertices so we can ask the same question are there any other complete Riemannian surfaces where Pinkel's theorem holds right so Nieser's theorem must be simply connected well so again it turned out that uh, Pinkel theorem right so his theorem was pretty darn sharp <laughs> he could you couldn't get rid of the ambient space and then the ambient space had to be um, simply connected so it's it's a kind of a very fussy thing this uh, four vertex theorem is very special I guess that's what the uh, conclusion of the talk is okay so how do you do it uh, again by counter examples but uh, so actually it was funny you know I was always trying to prove something in the positive but it wasn't working so I had to come up with these counter examples but it took a while because this, uh, this counter example some of them were pretty wicked as you see shortly so the elliptic case okay so again you have to consider cases here right so I have to show that everything has to be simply connected in the positive curvature zero curvature and negative curvature in the positive curvature it's not bad so this is a model of RP2 with constant curvature. The way you can think about it is that RP2 is what is just uh, S2 with antipodal points uh, identified. So you can think of it as the upper hemisphere with the equator identified. And here we're looking at the upper hemisphere from top. Uh, so this, this, it looks like two curves, but it's actually a single curve after the identification. And as you see, it bounds a uh, region, as I have drawn and it's going to have two vertices the two vertices are in the loops along the boundary you're going to have your uh, uh, inflection points so this is a curve which bounds a compact domain in RP2 but has only uh, two vertices so RP2 is not going to be good uh, that's the only non simply connected uh, space of positive curvature so How, sorry, can yes you actually Uh, I guess I guess you can parameterize it if you want, but uh, uh, just the yeah, just just analyzing the picture, right? So, so here 
You start with the line, right? So the curvature is very small. It gets bigger, bigger. And then this is the maximum. And then you reflect it. So the curvature, again, follows a monotonic uh, path. So that was the basic idea. Uh, but for more complicated examples, I give you the parametrization. No, 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 no. <laughs> okay, so the parabolic case. So this turned out to be the uh, hardest case. So now in the parabolic case, it's enough just to construct an example on the cylinder because the cylinder covers any other parabolic surface, right? You just want to construct a curve which bounds an immersed surface with two vertices. And then the covering map preserves both properties. It preserves vertices and also it sends your domain to the target. So all you need to do is just to construct one on the cylinder. So how do you put one on the cylinder? So early on I noticed that it's not so hard to construct one on a torus. So this is an example of a curve on the torus with only two vertices, which bounds a uh, compact immersed domain. So first of all, where is the domain? Let's see. OK, so here's the domain. Now, so where is the curve? Why is it just one curve? It looks like two curves. But to see why it's one curve, we start tiling the plane, which is the cover of the torus. OK, so tile it once and tile it again. So there is the curve. And uh, it has only uh, two vertices, two vertices and two inflection points. The vertices lie uh, inside the loops. So for the torus, it wasn't so hard. Uh, <clears throat> unfortunately, the same thing doesn't work on the cylinder. Because if you put this on the cylinder, you get an uh, unbounded domain. right? The cylinder is just like this picture, but uh, it's an infinite strip as opposed to a compact region. So how do you do it for the darn cylinder? So this took longer than I care to confess to you. Let's see. So this is the example on the cylinder. Uh, so this is a little bit harder to see. And the reason this was so hard is because actually you have to uh, tile it three times to see the curve. But uh, let's see. So first, where is the region? This is the region. And so where is the curve? So here, let's, let's tile. So that's the curve. And uh, so then, and this is the parametrization again. <laughs> so, so you can compute that it has only uh, uh, two vertices. <coughs> but actually, the parametrization is harder than it looks. I, I tell you the trick to figure out the parametrization. Actually, the parametrization is very easy. See, the way you figure out the parametrization is um, if you just, uh, this curve, in a polar coordinates has a very simple equation. And then uh, you can also write the equation in the Cartesian coordinates. And the red curve is the unit circle. Then you just shift, shift the curve a little bit. And then uh, the next step is uh, we're going to invert it in the circle. Inversion uh, preserves vertices. So if you invert it, let's first make it a little bit smaller so that you see that. So now if you invert it, then you get that curve. So. So it was just, it wasn't a difficult trick. OK, so that, that takes care of the parabolic case. Now, the hyperbolic case is going to be uh, uh, very kind of very similar. Again, you, you pick a simple closed geodesic, and then you lift it up to the universal cover in the half plane. You're going to get this uh, straight line. And um, so I mean, this is basically the analog picture in the hyperbolic uh, of the previous picture that I showed, right? So you have this. Yeah, so this is the picture for the Euclidean cylinder, and basically for the hyperbolic cylinder with like one cusp and one ball end. This is what the picture looks like. It's the same region, but uh, the, here the isometries are dilations. So this proves uh, uh, Pinkel's theorem as well, and completes the circle of these. Uh, negative results via these uh, counterexamples. Uh, let's see, in closing, I guess I had maybe a couple other remarks. Right, so one, one thing is that if, if you're picky, right, we, we figured out uh, what are all spaces where Nieser's theorem holds. That is, simple closed curves have 
four vertices. And we figured out what are all spaces where Pinkos theorem holds, that is, uh, boundaries of immersed surfaces have four vertices. Now, there is a middle condition. You can ask, uh, what are all complete Riemannian surfaces where every closed curve which bounds a compact embedded surface, okay? So Pinko was compact immersed surface, this was compact embedded surface, and uh, here's again, it's a little, little surprise, but uh, the proof is just using the ideas that I said. So here the only examples are uh, uh, orientable space forms of uh, genus zero, so you have the R2, S2, and H2, then for some reason you pick up a flat tori, and also RP2. Uh, will be example. So again, this is kind of curious. This is the only topological condition I know which is um, which encompasses uh, R2, S2, Taurus, and RP2. Right? That's, what do they have in common? This is the, the only thing I know. And uh, Right, so uh, you ask about uh, Jackson's theorem. It's very nice, but uh, uh, it's a local statement, right? If you look at the small circles around points where the curvature is non-stationary, you have only two vertices. Uh, so this is a, a global version of that. So all these papers are available on my website, by the way. You can see proof of this. So this was also kind of a curious thing. I just did it by computation, and I was surprised by the result. So, if you have a great circle on the sphere, uh, you can never perturb it to have two vertices. Any perturbation must have four vertices by Nisa's theorem on the sphere. But it turns out that uh, that's, that's very special. If you have a closed geodesic in pretty much any other surface of constant curvature, they can always be uh, perturbed. So the only time that it doesn't happen is for the case of uh, great circles on the sphere. And so and this perturbation is just local, right? So we have a lot of surfaces of constant curvature. They're not complete, right? You have like this bead-shaped surface of revolution. In all of those things, you can uh, perturb the, um, the closed geodesics, like, which could be even meridians, to obtain two uh, vertices. So this was kind of a curious thing. And the proof is just there by a, a computation that I did. So it seemed very strange, but maybe um, a more transparent or deeper reason behind it. It has to do probably with the period of the Jacobi fields along the geodesic. So the period just gets uh, messed up for uh, great circles on the sphere. But in any other case, you can uh, perturb them. OK, so it gets uh, getting close to uh, uh, lunch time, so I won't uh, impose on your patience much more. So, thank you very much. <laughs>